Welcome to this video. Um, my name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom. And in this video, I wanted to actually have a look at a recent discovery that was made that might suggest we've actually just seen two super Earths colliding around another star. So what we're going to do is have a look at the actual system itself and why we think this might have occurred and the observations that were taken to actually see whether this actually happened or not. So the actual star itself is a particularly uninteresting young sun-like star. So it's a fairly young star. It is sun-like. So it would have been maybe what the, the young sun would have been like. And it does have a circumstellar disk around it, or at least some material orbiting around it. So it's not just a star. It's still in the young phase, basically. And a lot of young stars are going to have these circumstellar disks around them, or debris disks depending on what stage they're at. So we think that this is basically what the star is. I'm not going to read out the name. You can see it's um, quite a long, uninteresting name there, which is just the catalogue name basically for the star. So that's the star. Um, what actually happened then? Why do we think there may have been a collision of planets around this star, which is the first time it's ever really been detected? Well, this is a light curve of the star. So if you haven't come across a light curve before, what we basically do is we observe a star over some period of time. We keep taking images of it and we basically work out how bright it is. And that's the flux on the y-axis there, how bright the actual star is. And you'll notice that it's actually um, one. So the maximum value there is one. And we always kind of normalize that, which means that we just divide the, the rest of the plot by the maximum value and it always puts it to one. So then we can see relative movements in its brightness. Now, most stars, even the sun, are gonna change brightness but this particular one had a very complex dimming event in the optical part of the spectrum. And you can see there where I've kind of highlighted that part on the right. So it dimmed down quite a lot. And it was a it was quite complex, asymmetric. There was no, you know, it wasn't a symmetric dip in brightness. Now, if it was an exoplanet, which is how we discover some exoplanets, or quite a lot actually, I should say, is that when the planet passes in front of the star, as we look at it, it blocks out some of the light. Now, because the planet is mostly spherical they do deviate in shape slightly same again with the star you've basically got two circles one is passing in front of the other you get a fairly nice symmetric dip there are deviations away from that so if that planet had a moon it may be slightly asymmetric we actually haven't really discovered any of those yet or if it had a ring system it might look a bit different but a fairly typical exoplanet is going to have a fairly symmetric dip like this here. But you do get stars that have an asymmetric dip in brightness. And this one here is because of a cloud of debris. So if you've got a cloud of debris orbiting the star, but then blocks out some of the light, it can look a lot more complex and more chaotic, or there's no real pattern to it. And it can block out a lot of light. And one example of that is a, is a cloud of debris, which could also be a swarm of comets as well, which is one idea that was thought to cause these sorts of events. So these are not a single object passing in front of the star. It's more like a ring, a disk, or just a cloud of debris that blocks out some of the light as we actually look at the star. Now, interestingly, so that particular event is not unusual in its, on its own. A dip in brightness, a complex dip in the optical part of the spectrum. Again, it's been seen before, and it's normally because of cloud of debris. However, two and a half years before that, a interesting event occurred that saw an increase in the infrared emission. So this is the first time these two events have been observed around a star with a delay between them as well. So this was two and a half years before, and this is from WISE, which is a space telescope looking in the infrared part of the spectrum. And you can see there that actually there was a sudden increase in the amount of infrared emission from that particular star. And that lasted about a thousand days before it kind of reduced back down again. So what on earth might have caused that? Well, one idea really is that it was a cloud of debris and from a collision. Now, the two and a half year gap between the two events from the increase in infrared and then the actual dip in the optical brightness suggests that the orbital period of the event is at least two and a half years. So let's say you had a collision of two planets that were on 
some distance from the star. Their orbital period was about two and a half years prior to actually colliding. The resulting material or debris cloud is going to have a similar sort of period. And if it's orientated such that that would then pass in front of the star, you'd have a delay of about two and a half years if it occurred just after when it would have actually passed in front of the star, basically. So, yeah, so let's assume that the collision between two planets occurred somewhere on that orbit. It then took two and a half years for it to then pass in front of the star as we as we look at it, basically. So that's where this two and a half year gap comes from, suspectedly, basically. And then that debris passes in front, blocks the light up. So that's what we get. So why do we get an infrared excess? Well, if you've got a star and a dusty disk, then the actual disk itself emits mostly in the infrared part of the spectrum. And the reason for that is the disk actually intercepts some of the starlight and it warms it up. And the disk isn't actually very hot in comparison to the star. And because of that, it emits at much longer wavelengths, which is in the infrared part of the spectrum, whereas the star would emit at higher energies or shorter wavelengths. So you, if you've got a star with a disk, you typically get an excess of infrared emission. And we can't norm, we don't always get to see the, the, the disk around the star because they're too far away. But if we look at the energy being emitted by the star, we would have an excess that shouldn't be there unless there's a disk, basically. So we get this infrared excess emitted from the, the, the dust in the disk. So the peak wavelength then relates to your temperature. So a hotter star is going to basically emit at a much higher energy. So it has smaller wavelengths. And you can work out the temperature by looking at the emission. So you have a, this black body sort of shape to the emission over the wavelength and the energy. And the hotter it is, it will be further to the left, which basically means it's going to have a shorter wavelength. The cooler stars is going to be on the, the other side, so it'll have a longer wavelength. And this then relates to your disk as well, because the disk is, is a lot cooler than the star, and it emits mostly in infrared, it's going to be quite a way over to the longer wavelengths, essentially. I'm not exactly marked the correct part of that plot there, but it's just to give you an idea that it's going to be in a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum compared to the star. Again, that's where your infrared excess is going to come from. So there you go. Star emits at the higher energies, the disk emits at the infrared. Again, contributing to that excess. So if you actually break down the disk itself, then different parts of the disk actually emit at different wavelengths. So the inner part, which is closer to the star, is going to be hotter. So that will emit at the shorter wavelengths of the infrared part of the spectrum and then the bit that's further away. So if in, for example, with our solar system, like the Kuiper belt, further out than that, they're going to be much, much cooler because they're further away from the star. They're not as warm. They emit at the longer wavelengths. So depending on where it is in the disk, then it's going to have a different temperature, which then relates directly to the wavelength that it actually mostly emits at. Now, normally, like I mentioned before, we actually can't resolve the disk itself. There are cases where we can, um, but that's not always the case. So what we actually do is we observe the emission from the star, where it's the optical part of the spectrum, infrared. We're mostly just looking at a point source of light. So we can only infer things about the star from that light that's emitted. And the contribution from the disk and the star we basically get the whole thing together. We can't typically resolve the two. So what happened then? If we had a giant planetary collision, it's going to cause a localized increase in the temperature. So there's going to be a part in that disk where you get a sudden increase in temperature, which can then relate to your sudden increase in the infrared part of the spectrum. Again, it's not going to be as hot as the star. It'll be hotter than the, than the rest of the disk, but it won't be hotter than the star. So you get a, a sudden increase in the temperature and also, as a result of that, an increase in the infrared emission as well. Now, what you can do then is you can work out what the temperature of that was. And the measurements suggested with this particular one that this infrared emission 
was consistent with a black body temperature of about a thousand Kelvin. So again, you can see that's much cooler than the star. Typical red giant, red dwarf stars, which are going to be your cooler stars, are on the order of like two to three thousand Kelvin. And that's a very cool star. Our sun is just under 6,000 Kelvin. So you can see that this event is still quite cool and hence why it's also going to be emitting on the longer wavelengths in comparison to a fairly typical star. So about 1,000 Kelvin, they expect that the resulting collision was or the debris field that was then created. So what you can then do is you can look at the maximum luminosity of the event. And that was about 4% of the total star output in the infrared part of the spectrum. So the infrared from this event was about 4% of the star. So it's a fairly significant event. And we've got the luminosity, we've also got the temperature. And if you know those, you can then start to work out what the actual size of this debris field or cloud was post collision. And it works out to around about seven times the radius of the sun or 750 times the radius of Earth. That's a fairly large debris cloud that's been generated from this particular event. And if you know all of that, you can actually start to work out what the size of the planets were before they actually collided. Um, now, the interesting thing is, you can't get a thousand Kelvin in one of these circumstellar disks without a collision or some other event happening, unless it's very close to the star. So in order for you to get a thousand Kelvin, you need to be in the disk about 0.1 AU from the star, which is very close. It's very, very close to the star, and that's because it's been heated by the star. So that's the only other way you can really get this sort of high temperature in the disk without the collision. So we know that's not been the case. So we can rule that out. So what we can then do is work out the orbital parameters and the sizes of these planets before they collided, really, so by working back from what we've actually detected. So again, we can we can make the assumption that the orbital period has to be at least two and a half years because of that delay between the infrared emission and then the optical dimming event. And that suggests that if the collision happened literally straight after they would have passed in front of the star, as we look at it, it then took two and a half years for the debris field or cloud to then pass back again. It's most likely going to be much longer than that because it could actually occur somewhere on that. So what we can do is we then we can work out the semi-major axis of the planets where you know at the, at the point they actually collided. And you can use Kepler's third law here to find it. And we know the orbital period, or we don't know it. We've got a kind of a limit on that basically. We know what the lower limit is going to be, so it's going to be at least this. So P there is your orbital period, and that's between the delay. And the mass of the star would have been calculated using a different method. So you can do different methods basically to get the mass of the star. So we, we would already have had that. And from that, you can then get A, which is your semi-major axis. And it will give us a bit of a range of where these planets were located before they collided. And this gives us a semi-major axis of between 2 and 16 AU. And that is further out than Earth is. From the sun. So these are planets that are much further out, not necessarily much further out, but they are further out in the system than what Earth is currently. So we can then actually get the mass. Now in giant collisions like this, there's a certain amount of the total mass is going to get ejected into this debris cloud. And it's, it's only approximate, but it can give you, you can start to refine down the size of the planets before they collide. So let's say about 1% of the total mass is ejected into this debris cloud after the collision. We've measured the potential size of it, the temperature, all those sorts of things. We can then actually work back from that and get an idea that these planets were about tens of Earth masses. So now we're starting to look at super Earths. So both planets were likely bigger than Earth and less than Neptune. So we would we can call these super Earths or sub-Neptonian. So these are fairly large planets that have then had a giant collision. And again, this might be the first time this has actually been detected, which is exciting. Now, why do planets collide? It's not a particularly rare thing. We know in our own solar system, most of the planets have had a giant impact at some point in their evolution. The Earth had one. That's why we have 
the moon is why we're tilted over there's lots of other examples of other planets where giant collisions have likely occurred now in the formation process planets aren't really settled down in their orbits they do wander about a little bit until they're settled and as they wander about they get closer to other planets and this means that they exert a gravitational force as they pass by that can actually disturb their orbits further and it can actually change their orbits even more so if you get two planets that pass by each other they don't actually collide it can actually almost gravitationally scatter them so it can make their orbits more elliptical it can change the distance from the star that they are and over time what can then happen is those planets will pass each other's orbits and occasionally they're actually on a collision course and they're going to hit each other and we know this happens from doing theoretical work simulations we know from our own solar system this has likely happened but to actually capture it occurring is probably the first time that can really confirm this is um, an important aspect of the planet formation process so thank you for watching and if you enjoy then check out some of the other videos